Hello and welcome to Remote, the Connected Faculty Summit. My name is Nisha Sridharan and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, there are a few things to note. Uh, on the left side of your screen, you'll see a panel with a few key tabs. Chat allows you to interact with your fellow attendees, uh, so please feel free to use that at any time. The questions tab enables you to submit your questions for the speakers to answer at the end of the presentation. You can also click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Uh, please do go ahead and submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, slides and uh, a PDF of the slide can be found at the handouts tab, and you can download this by clicking the view button. Uh, if needed, please feel free to resize and rearrange your uh, screen, the panels on your screen, just like you would a, on a browser window. Click icons at the bottom of your screen to open and close additional panels, such as speaker bios, abstracts, share, and also hangout handouts. Should you have technical issues, please refresh your browser. If your issues are not resolved, please submit a note to the questions tab for assistance. So today's presentation is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand after the event. Now onto the presentation, effectively and efficiently ac um, access written work remotely. Discussing today's panel topic is Sarah Clark, who is the senior instructor and academic advisor at Oregon State University, and Katie Dumel, who's a math instructor at Oregon State University. So let's get started. Uh, I welcome Katie and Sarah. Hi, everyone, and thanks for the intro. I'm Sarah Clark. We're hoping to keep this part of our presentation short and sweet, so we have ample time for discussion and questions uh, during the second half. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by handing it over to Katie to get us started. All right, just a brief little introduction about what we're going to share with you. Uh, we're going to talk about how we used some components of our online courses to make the transition to remote classes a little bit smoother. So here on the screen, you can see a few examples of some engaging interactive videos that we actually created with the help and the support of OSU eCampus. And we will also provide you several tools and techniques uh, to assess students' written work in both the formative and the summative assessments during remote classes. So hopefully you get to take that away with you and apply it to your classes. And now while we primarily teach math courses ranging anywhere from pre-college algebra to vector calculus and anywhere from size classes of 20 students to 200 students, uh, we know that these methods can be applied to any discipline any class size, and any course format. So we will talk about some really specific uh, elements of our courses, but we quickly wanted to start just with our non-written elements so that you know that there's a lot of other things going on in these courses. Um, so like Katie mentioned, um, we have uh, video lectures and accompanying, accompanying PDFs um, for students to take notes on. Um, and like Katie said, with the help of our fantastic eCampus, we were able to make lightboard videos for at least one topic each week. And uh, some of them even have animations. So the picture that we have up here is, uh, this is actually a picture of me um, doing a video about an otter diving in to the water. And I drew the graph and then our wonderful eCampus animators put that otter um, over the top. And it's a really cute little animation that the students can see how that path of the otter um, is is given and we've also though curated some additional open source videos to have extra resources for our students uh, we use adaptive online homework systems our students participate in weekly q a discussion boards and our learning assistants uh, help us monitor those uh, we have interactive desmo desmos activities and in video quizzes um, these tend to take the place of activities that we usually do in our in-person classes um, and then the students also complete reflections at key checkpoints during the term to help self-assess where their progress is in the course. So now we want to focus on a few ways that we do assess the students written work since that's really what we wanted to focus on and give you some tools for. So starting with the written homework. 
There are a few ways that we've collected and assessed written homework in our classes, and we want to share them both with you since they do have slightly different purposes and they use different technologies. So after going through the details of these two different options, we will share the benefits and the considerations to choosing uh, which one may be best for you. So we're going to call this option one for the sake of um, simplicity in this presentation. And option one is a written homework and a reflection. So this is a low stakes assessment uh, where the homework is graded for completion and effort only. And there's a second part that consists of a graded piece where there's a reflection of the students comparing their work to an answer key, a complete solution key. And this reflection, which is usually done in a discussion board format in our LMS system canvas is graded. So then we have option two. Option two is a written homework where a subset of the problems that students turn in are randomly selected, randomly, maybe not so random, <laughs> and graded for correctness. And the remainder are then just graded for completion. So it's still a low stakes assessment and the students still do have access to the answer key. So with the first option, here's an example of the uh, instructions that we have for our students. Um, we give the written homework as a PDF and students complete their homeworks are several different ways. Some of the students print the PDF and write out their work on that actual paper. Um, you know, since students are home now, a lot of students have been downloading the PDF onto a tablet and writing their solutions that way. And, you know, we've also gotten a little more flexible in letting our students do the work on separate sheets of paper as long as it's clearly labeled. Um, then the students submit their PDF solutions to the the Canvas assignment. Um, and like we said before, that this part of the assignment is graded solely for completion and if they've put effort into each of the questions. Like we don't necessarily even look to see if they got to an answer, just if they've done some work and made some progress. Um, and our students have gotten really good at using um, these free picture to PDF apps that they can take pictures of their work, convert them to a PDF, and then upload them to our LMS. So then as Katie was saying, the second part of the homework, once they get their written homework uploaded is this reflection discussion board post. Um, and this opens once the due date of the first assignment that that PDF has passed. Um, and so it opens up the discussion board and then they get access to those written homework solutions. So um, the purpose of the reflection is for the students to take that metacognitive cognitive step of reflecting on their work, looking at their mistakes, and ultimately learning from them. The students do usually need a little help in the first few weeks to get past them just writing, I made a mistake on problem 5C. Um, and they do get more detailed with the reflections as the term progresses. This is another thing our learning assistants help us with, you know, giving them some more prompts um, of things to think about if they're not being very detailed in their reflection. Um, these reflection posts do allow for us as instructors to learn really quickly what concepts are the class is still struggling with um, from the previous week so that we can address those questions um, and points of confusion with a video from us or an announcement or some additional resources for them to look at. Um, here's just a quick example of a written homework solution that one of our learning assistants made for us. Um, it's a really great way for um, for those learning assistants to contribute to the course. And it's also nice for students to get that different voice other than just the instructor's uh, voice during the term. Um, here's an example reflection post. Notice that's pretty dense um, given by a student from a previous course. It's a little dense to read through the whole thing, but we did want to highlight her conclusion that she kind of wrapped things up with. And she said that, so overall, my issue was a consistent one of interpreting the end behavior of a function as I made the same mistake every time. I actually feel good about that because it's something I think I've essentially fixed in time for the exam. So the great thing about this is our students are doing that thing we always want them to do, reading over those answer keys figuring out for themselves the mistake that they're making. She noticed it was the same mistake over and over again. Um, and we're always just consistently surprised at how seriously our students take both parts of these assignments. They'll send us emails saying how sorry they were that they couldn't complete the whole written homework. And I'm like, it's okay. So it's, it's really nice that even though we grade them just for completion, they take them very seriously. Okay, so that was option one. Now option two, let's get into kind of the details of what this looks looks like. Uh, so you can see listed here, we have the instructions. Uh, students complete the homework kind of similarly to option one by either downloading the printed copy, writing on that, using a tablet or writing on um, just a blank sheet of paper, pretty organized work. 
And then they take that and they upload their assignment actually to Gradescope. So we're not using our LMS this time. We're using an online tool called Gradescope that's used for student submissions and for instructor grading. So here you can see that students are provided with some resources to help them upload their work. So grading in Gradescope is done problem by problem, whereas in most LMS systems that I know of at least, it's done student by student or assignment by assignment. So the grading in Gradescope is more consistent, more equitable and unbiased. So Sarah will talk a little bit later in this presentation about this tool. And then after they do that, uh, we, the instructors or the GTAs, choose a subset of those problems that we want to focus on giving feedback and we grade those for correctness. And then the remainder are just completion grades. And then obviously we still want them to be able to view the solutions. It's just that it's not part of their grade this time. And so they can still view the answer key and then a detailed rubric is available for them in Gradescope. So likewise, here's an example of just some solutions that we post and we just want to ensure that they can see every single step of the problem and that the answers are fully explained. So now some benefits and some considerations as maybe you're choosing which one would make sense in your class. So benefit to option one, the written homework and the reflection. So students are forced to take ownership of their learning and their understanding because they're having to find out what mistakes they made and why they made the mistakes. This is the thing that we're always wanting them to do is to take their work, compare with the solution, and figure out where there was a gap. And it's now a part of their grade. So that's the really great thing here is that we're grading them on using the answer key. A benefit to option two uh, is that students are receiving uh, consistent feedback. So a, a really uh, positive about Gradescope is that students are using, or that we have that rubric in there, and it's um, easy to identify where there were misconceptions. So because of the tool, we get this uh, statistics back and Sarah will talk about that a little bit later in the term or a little bit later in this talk. So there are some benefits to both and now some considerations that you might think about uh, when choosing for your course. Um, the level of the course. So level of the course and the subject matter confidence of your students. Uh, for example, we have personally found that in lower level courses, option one works really well because students can be a little bit intimidated by grading for correctness. But when they know that they're not graded for correct answers and that they're just learning, they actually feel a little bit more welcomed and they end up learning more and we get really good feedback on that. Um, however, I will say that we have used option one in pretty high level calculus courses and it still works really well. Uh, another consideration will be the compo other components of your course. So if you have most of your course that's graded for correctness, maybe the completion option is a better option for you. And then of course, you have to consider the tools and the technology that's available to you and your students. Uh, for example, the use and availability of Gradescope. So if this is something that your institution already has, that could be an option. And if not, I do think that they are offering their tool free through the end of 2020, like a lot of other technologies are being offered. So another way we assess written work is on midterms and finals. So the summative assessment. And of course, before everything went remote, like a lot of you, I'm sure, our on-campus classes took their paper-based exams, but our online classes did as well. So they took in-person proctored exams. But with the switch to remote, we had to make this change pretty quickly. And so we had to figure out a way to collect and assess students' written work for exams. So as Katie mentioned before, Gradescope is a great tool for grading exams. And we use this um, a lot in our courses before we even went remote. Um, and we are very thankful um, that Oregon State has a site license for Gradescope. So that's made it um, so that it's L uh, integrated into our LMS menu. So over um, on the left hand side of the screen, there is our Canvas menu inside our course and that there's a Gradescope button and when students click on and go into Gradescope um, They're they're may you know brought to a dashboard that looks very very similar to um, Canvas so it's really um, not a big transition um, or a big leap for the students to use Gradescope um, 
for their courses. And one of the best features um, that we love about Gradescope is that it has a grouping feature for grading. Um, this is invaluable when we teach our large enrollment multi-section courses. Um, we get the same exam for all sections of say differential calculus, all students take the same exam and then we grade them all together in Gradescope. Um, and so here in the center is a quick example of a multiple choice question um, in Gradescope and Gradescope looks where the little dots are and then it groups all the students that answered the you know option one together option two together option three together and then you can give full credit or partial credit or no credit based on how the student answered um, you can also do uh, grouping by the grader this is really nice when you have short answer questions um, you can look at little thumbnails of everyone's answers and group all the correct answers together, all the people that made, you know, similar mistakes together, um, just like you would when you were grading things by hand. Um, this has really st streamlined our grading greatly. Um, the graders can make very detailed rubrics. We've got an example of a detailed rubric over there on the right hand side. Um, those rubrics are also dynamic. They can be changed while you're grading them. So if you notice the same mistake over and over again and you decide, oh boy, this is something I didn't talk about well, I was gonna take two points off for this, but maybe this is more on me since everyone's making a mistake and you can change it to taking one point off and it will retroactively um, change that for everybody that's been graded with that rubric option. This also keeps the grading process really transparent for the student. They could see all the things that we were taking off points for and they can start to know like the things that we value when they're looking, when we're looking at their work. Um, it also, as Katie said, we get really detailed statistics for every single question in Gradescope, not just the multiple choice questions. We always used to get really good information about multiple choice questions on Scantrons, but now we get that for our open-ended questions as well. We can really quickly see, just even looking at this bar graph, what st questions students did well on, which ones they struggled on. Like we can see question four there is very low. It's about 25% of the students got that correct. But then we can look at question 15 and go, oh, everybody got that right. So we can start to, to nail down where our students are still having problems and where they're doing well. Um, in the new remote environment, um, we've taken advantage of one of the newer things in Gradescope, which is a Gradescope assignment. Um, these assignments allow our students to actually take their exam in the Gradescope environment. Um, we can ask all different types of questions. There's multiple choice, there's short answer, there's mini select, there's long answer, and there's file upload questions. So I've got on the screen here an example of a short answer question that I used um, on an exam recently. This is the student view, so this is what they see. Um, and then this is what I see on my end. Um, there's my student's answer, and then over there is my rubric of how I graded um, that particular question. Um, the file uploads have been really nice um, in the college algebra style courses that I teach. We want them to do gra draw graphs a lot or solve equations. So we want them to show their work. And with this Gradescope file upload question, they can take a picture with their phone um, of their, their work and then upload it to Gradescope. And Gradescope takes many, many file types. Um, they can do multiple files. So on the left-hand side there, that is Again, that student view where the student had, I uploaded two different um, types of file. And then on the right-hand side, that's the, again, the instructor view. Um, it's, it was a little long to take one big picture of, they had to scroll all the way through, but you can see up there, that's the first picture, um, that first file. So it's really nice for the students. Um, so all of these elements that we have for our course do work so well together because of our well-structured LMS course sites. Um, we've been able to take the best practices of course design that we learned from our developments with e our eCampus and apply them to our on-campus and our remote courses as well. So our all of our uh, Canvas sites start with a welcome and opening an open environment, and we try to make it really clear to the students where they need to go and what they need to do to get started. So going along with that, um, each week has a consistent structure. So students know what to expect each week. Every week, week looks the same, and that happens in our weekly modules in Canvas. So here are two examples of what a module consists of and how it may be organized. These are just two different types of courses. Um, 
they all start with a weekly overview page. So here's an example of what an overview may look like. It includes an introduction that kind of summarizes what the week will consist of. It has the learning objectives and it has a to-do list with uh, the days and the times that things are due. Then each module contains pages that has the learning materials. These can be things like videos, um, any assignments, and then always a Q&A discussion board. So this consistent structure, it really helps create this weekly cycle that a student passes through every single week um, with that consistent flow from beginning to end. Uh, it starts with uh, notes and videos or any content that they're being delivered. And then it moves to some sort of online homework assignment. Uh, we happen to use Alex in a few of our courses. We use Newton and some others, but it's a smaller online homework assignment. And then they dive into the written homework. Uh, this happens to have that option one where they also have a reflection. And then at the end of the week, they're doing their kind of larger summative online homework. So that flow helps a student know what to expect and it keeps things nice and organized. Due dates are always consistent. So thank you so much. We hope this was uh, helpful to, to you as you begin to uh, plan for your summer or fall courses, as I'm sure some of those are planning to be remote and we look forward to your questions and your discussion. Thank you for your presentation, Katie and Sarah. Um, I just wanted to let everyone uh, know that the video will be available to watch on demand after the event if you want to go back and look at some stuff. I see we have a couple of questions from the audience. So let's get started with the Q&A now. Uh, the first question I have here is from Camila Valenta, and uh, they ask if, is there a way to remotely administer a closed book written exam? What are some suggestions that you might have on this? <laughs> yeah, that's the question we're all uh, asking at this point in time, isn't it? Um, I don't think that we have solved that just quite yet. Not totally. Um, no. But I, we can tell you kind of what we have done. And I, I think the reason that we haven't gotten there is because what we keep running into when we're trying to use any of these proctoring services, whether it's uh, Proctorio or ProctorU, is that we find that there's it's, it's just not equitable for certain students. Um, they may not have a webcam or they may not feel comfortable uh, videoing their, their room or wherever they're staying. Um, so we, we have a hard time enforcing that policy when it's not um, equitable. And so kind of what we've come up with is open book type exams because we're not expecting them to close everything down um, on their honor. Um, and just, I don't know, we're, we're kind of closing it to, you know, asking them not to Google things and maybe just use the resources we've given them, but that, that's our solution. We've also put time limits on them, like that they, once they start the exam, they have two hours to finish it or, you know, a little bit extra since they're possibly needing to, you know, upload a graph um, or something like that. Um, we've also, you know, really changed the kinds of questions that we ask on our uh, midterms and final exams because they have access to their resources. Um, so it's been a lot less um, computational heavy and more interpretation um, because, you know, we know that they have access to things like Wolfram Alpha and Chegg. And so it's also meaning that we're having to mix things up a little more um, and a little more often than we were probably used to um, before. Yeah. And I think um, before we jump Thank into you. the do you mind if we just answer? There's a few kind of logistics questions that are super quick, um, yeah. and they were all really good kind of clarifying questions. So we'll jump into a few of those. Um, some of you asked about just, you know, how to deal with students who don't have smartphones um, or cameras for uploading that written work, um, and then maybe who don't have a scanner. And quite honestly, I have yet to run into that issue um, after five years of this. I haven't either. <laughs> um, so whether it's a digital camera or um, a spouse or a kid's phone um, or a cam or a scanner at work, um, students have been able to submit things to us. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying that the issue is not there, um, but it hasn't been something that we have had to run into um, yet. And when we're when we're on campus, um, on, on campus, our library has free scanners for our students to use. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I, I'm surprised that we have not run into that issue more often. Mm -hmm. um, I think in all the time we've asked students to upload scan work, I maybe I think I've had two students 
and they were in-person students. So we were able to, to deal with it a little differently, but I haven't run into it yet with our online students. Um, and, oh, we were asked a couple of the apps that um, our students like to use. Um, they like Cam Scanner. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with Cam Scanner. I think there's two different versions of it, one of which is free and one of which is not. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, Mobile Scanner is also a really nice one. Um, both of those take pretty nice pictures. Um, you know, of course, we do occasionally run into some bad photos that students take, and we have to ask them to re resubmit sometimes. Yeah. Uh, we did get a question about whether students had the option of choosing option one or option two for grading in a particular course. That's more of the instructor choice. Um, it's easier to set it up kind of one way or another. Um, uh, I, I've mostly done the um, the first choice where they we just grade it for completion and then we look at the reflection. Um, but I've also done classes with option two. It's just been a little while. So, do do yeah, so yeah. some logistics questions on grade scope. Um, can students, um, can you give the exception for like late or early submissions in grade scope? You cannot do that. You can allow for the whole class to submit late. Um, so that maybe is a li limitation for you. Uh, one workaround that I found for that for, you know, a student needs to submit something to me early or a few days late is I just say, send me your work. So send me your images or your PDF because instructors can actually upload submissions for students. So maybe a little bit extra of a headache, but that's kind of what I have come mm -hmm. to do with that. Um, somebody asked about our integration. We're integrated with Canvas, um, and so what that means in turn, what that looks like is that we have a menu option in Canvas, and students click on it, and it takes them to GradeScope. Um, and the stats don't necessarily come back to Canvas. Um, they're all in GradeScope, um, and we did have a question if it will automatically grade open-ended questions. It won't do that. It can read um, handwriting. So some of our short answer questions or fill in the blank. Um, and it generally does a pretty good job of reading those and grouping those together. Um, but for our open-ended questions, um, we still use that grouping feature because we see just a thumbnail of the student's answer. And we can scan through those pretty quickly and figure out you know, which ones are correct and which ones uh, are you know blank or incorrect. And then it just leaves those sort of you know, 20 or 30 ones that you have to read really, really carefully um, because they did something kind of strange. Yeah. So still um, a lot more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Someone asked about our adaptive homework. Um, just to ex expand on that, we use Alex in some of our classes and we use Newton in some of our classes. So that's kind of the online adaptive homework piece, mm -hmm. just to clarify that as well. And then there's been a few questions I just saw. Um, about using a rubric for grading the reflections. And that is a really good question. Um, Sarah and I were just talking um, the other day about that. And we wish we kind of did a better job at actually creating a, a really standard rubric. Um, but I think because we've been using this for so long, we just kind of know the rubric in our head, which isn't a great way to do it, um, to be honest. So um, yes, we, we don't have a, a rubric that we can share with you, although we could probably put our thoughts on paper and that would be good homework for us too. <laughs> um, but yeah, our, our TAs do grade those. And like we said, at the beginning, like the first couple of weeks, we're taking off a lot more points on those because students didn't explain. Um, maybe they wrote a sentence or two or they just weren't following the prompts like we asked. Um, after that, they kind of see the benefit of them a little bit more and they're they're writing more. And so it's not that we don't write them. We look through them, but it's not that we're having to, you know, really scour them and look for points to take off. Um, they do a lot better job and, and generally get 100 percent for the yeah. most part on them. OK. Thank you. Um... There are a couple more questions. Um, yeah. One of the questions, I, I think you covered uh, a good amount. Uh, one of the questions that um, Evelyn uh, Nadiu had is, are there any FERPA issues in using grade scope? Uh, no, it's all FERPA uh, compliant. Yep, yeah. That's something that our university takes pretty seriously and that was one of the, the big hurdles that we had to get before we got the site license um, so yeah it is for book compliant yeah great question um another question here by which i think would be our last question because of time is uh when creating the rubrics for uh written homeworks uh how much do you weigh in on the content versus formatting references etc 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think my, my first instinct there is that the reflection isn't so much for me. Um, it's more for the students. So I guess I'm not too worried about the content or the format. Mm -hmm. um, it's really that I'm seeing that the students are recognizing their own mistakes and learning from it. So that's what we're grading for. Well, and, and that, that's kind of the really big point of them seeing that worked out solution is that their formatting might look a little different mm -hmm. um, or the way that they sort of think about the content may be a little different and for them to see how we think about it and how we you know format an answer um, i think it has made our students better at showing their work mm -hmm. because they see more of those worked out solutions um, and you know they've had time to think about oh well when i'm showing that i'm not showing all of those steps and it makes a lot more sense when all of them are shown. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're out of time today. Once again, I would like to thank Katie and Sarah for joining us today and providing their first-hand experience. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that you can access the session uh, by using the same link for uh, On Demand. And On Demand should be available within five to 10 minutes of the conclusion of this session. Please be sure to explore the event to access more valuable resources from our sponsors and networks and network with peers. Thank you and have a great day.